Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Author of Your Own Stories, Daily Growth Hacks. I am super excited to not only have an inspiring story, a leader, a friend, and my business partner, Eric Malzone, with us today. Eric, thanks so much for being here, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me, Doug. This is, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with this one for sure. Uh, this is a long time coming. And I think part of the reason this has taken so long to come to fruition is one, is I talk to you every day. Um, but two, is there's so many categories and things that you and I can talk about. And um, one thing that I think would be very inspiring for the listeners is you know, your story and knowing more about you. And also, when we talked about a few other things, but for those few people out there in the world that don't know who Eric Malzone is, uh, give us the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, obviously someone's story, I'm 42 years old. So the story uh, can get long or, you know, I can focus on the things that I think are relevant to what people want to hear um, or understand within the context of our conversation. So yeah, once again, thanks for having me on, Doug. You know, you and I know each other so well. Um, you know, I think we both take advantage, you know, take not advantage, but um, we don't really see how valuable our stories are because we talk to each other all the time, right? Absolutely. You know, but then you talk to other people and it's interesting. So, you know, my background is this. I'm a, I'm a Northern California native. I was born and raised um, in the Silicon Valley before it was the Silicon Valley. And uh, it was great. I had a great upbringing. Um, my dad was a self-made, um, you know, entrepreneur as a dentist, um, first generation Italian uh, coming over the boat. and um, very comfortable upbringing and you know i played sports really since the age of five that clearly um defines a lot of who i was and my as my identity as a youth um started swimming competitively at age five started playing water polo when i was 10 um, which launched me into about a 20-year career um, as a water polo player at all different levels and uh yeah so i went through high school went to college in boston um after graduating school, I went into the corporate track. So I went into um, recruitment, um, got promoted to sales director um, of my office rather quickly, jumped to another job in radio sales, um, went into uh, mortgages um, and real estate finance. Then that whole thing took the obvious dive that it did, uh, got another job in sales. And you know, all the while I was starting to have these realizations. You know, I was having a great time. I was living in San Francisco and you know, making good money and <clears throat> doing all the things that come along with that being in 20s and, and SF uh, at that time. But you know, I would go to these sales conferences and I would see people who were 10 years ahead of me on the same track. And I would be like, that's not me. I can't do that. I can't end up in that scenario because I'll go freaking crazy. <laughs> and you know, when an opportunity and when you start thinking like that, all of a sudden you start looking for opportunities and it wasn't very hard to look for it because I got a text message from uh, one of my college teammates, Traver Boehm. Um, it was about 2007. And uh, this was back when text messaging was like 444, 222. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't as easy as it is now. Uh, it was a lot more uh, intensive. And it just said, hey, do you want to open a gym? Wow. And I was like, okay, I, I was actually going out to happy hour on a Friday and I saw the read the text message. I'm like, oh, what's he talking about? And then I had one beer and I was like, yes, yes, I do. Six months later after that, uh, I had all my earthly belongings in a trailer um, pack moving from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, which is a city I never lived in, didn't know anybody. And I was going to open a business. And uh, I also just told my girlfriend at the time, like, you know what, I'm leaving town. So, uh, I made a big leap and uh, I just had full confidence that this is where I was going to go. And, you know, the biggest motivating factor on that was if I look back on this 10 years from now, will I regret not having tried? Wow. And that simple question mm -hmm. made it so clear, um, and exciting and all those things. And I also started boiling it down to, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? And I realized, well, the worst thing that can happen is I completely fall on my face. I'm embarrassed, but maybe I just go live on someone's couch. Or, you know, we rent the gym and uh, I sleep at the gym for a year, you know, and that's, that's it. And it wasn't that bad. So the alternative of not trying was way worse, mm -hmm. right? And way less exciting. And, and it went from there. So over that period of time, you know, grew the gym um, 
to, uh, you know, over eight years to a, a good sized gym, a successful business by most measures. And uh, 2016 was a very difficult year for myself, my wife. Um, we had just a lot of loss, you know, uh, you know, everyone says, I've heard this before. It's like, if you have that one thing that happens to you, that changes your DNA, it changes your chemistry. It's that one hardship. You know, if you don't, if you haven't had it yet, you don't know what that is. It's coming. It will come to you in your life. Um, it all happened in 2016. You know, it was between us thinking we were going to start a family uh, that abruptly came to rally that we weren't at that time. Um, then after that series of, of loss, then uh, my wife's father passed away at the age of 63. Mm. Um, we had another loss of a close friend. And then finally our dog passed. It was just all this thing within a year. And, you know, one, the biggest realization that came out of that to both of us was like life is, and this is not to be cliche, but it's just true. You know, life is very short and it can be taken at any minute. So let's really evaluate what we want to do. And then we started thinking about like, well, what do we always talk about? We always talk about living in this mountain town. You know, we always talk about, you know, you learning how to ski. I always talk about me wanting to do these things. And like, well, what's stopping us? you know, and we boil it down to, oh, it's my gym. It's my business. You know, that, that anchors us here. And, uh, once you get clarity on that, it was pretty simple. I'm like, well, I came home one night and just told her, I'm like, you know, I want to sell the gym. Let's do this. And she was like, wait, what are you messing with me? Do not mess with me on this. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm dead serious. And, uh, you know, after that decision was made, and I think that's the biggest thing is once a decision is made, then all you have to do is take the first, first step. Right. And that first step was me just writing down a list of people who I thought would be good buyers at the gym. Um, and that was step one. And then you take step two and then until you're done. And now, you know, you and I are business partners. We're growing this amazing online community um, of, of fitness entrepreneurs. Uh, my wife and I, uh, that was about a year and a half ago since we sold gym. It was uh, August 2017. Um, we've lived in seven different places. Um, throughout the Western North America. And, uh, she learned that we both skied 60 days last year. <laughs> and, you know, like I can't, I, it's just, it's, it all came down to making decisions that I thought were really, really hard, but they turned out being very easy. Awesome. Wow. Uh, you know, such an inspiring story and, and knowing some of that beforehand, seeing you go through some of this and then also just um, let's unpack a little bit of that for the people listening. So I hope you guys caught this, you know, Here's Eric sitting in a conference looking at, you did something that most people don't do is you looked towards the future by looking at the people who had been down that road before in sales, right? Uh, and you, you looked there and you said, you know what? I don't want to be there in 10 years. That is not my avatar. That is not, <laughs> that is not the story I want to live out into. And so you, through circumstances, but you kind of, you made that choice and you made a drastic pivot at that moment, right? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. And I think you've read this book, right? The Five Regrets of the Dying. Yep. The number one regret is living a life that's not true to yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's it. I mean, that, that really becomes in. If you, yeah, I think in everyone I know who's, who's making big leaps, you know, in a direction that um, is more authentic to themselves is, has that same ability to look forward 10 years. Yeah, yeah. You know, and everybody has it, just people don't do it. Why do you think people don't do it? I don't think they've ever had the realization. I think people get too stuck. They just get stuck in, in the weeds of their life from, okay, you know, I just got to get to tomorrow, right? You know, maybe the struggles can get overwhelming for some people or they're just, they're not having that, that forethought, making that time, you know, making that space for themselves to actually contemplate like, what am I doing mm -hmm. with my life right now? you know, uh, cause it's so easy, you know, if you start getting the paycheck, right. We all know the trap, start getting the paycheck. Um, maybe, you know, join your bowling league. Um, you know, you, you occupy space for the sake of occupying space in your life. And then you'll take that time to reflect. And then the next thing you know, 10 years are going by because yeah. it happens fast. Right. Oh yeah. It's really fast. Yep. You hear people talk about how fast it happens and you, then once you experience it, it's a whole totally different experience altogether, of course. And then, you see people, like you said, they join the bowling league. And the one I see the most is people get in just a little bit of debt, right? They get in just enough debt 
that they're like, ah, now I don't have that freedom because I need to work to pay off the debt. However, their lifestyle doesn't change. They don't make those drastic shifts and change their lifestyle. And then the debt increases and then they feel beholden to their job that they have to sit yeah. there and grind it out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it, this is probably where I'll lose people on this interview. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if they haven't left when I uh, just first started talking, then they're, they're, they're sticking around. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, we're walking, talking monkeys on a, sitting on organic flying sh- flying spaceship mm-hmm. and that sounds ridiculous but like all the problems you think you have when you're gone in 40 50 years no one's going to care about your debt you know we only get this one thing around and you know like I, I i can't i can't overemphasize the ability of the worst case scenario exercise so let's you walk know? let's walk people i've done that and i do it many times but let's yeah. walk someone through that if you would be willing to and I know you coach and mentor people so yourself so why don't you walk us through that exercise for somebody's listening and those listening if you're not driving or working at the gym pull out a piece of paper and take notes on what Eric's about to share with you Mm -hmm. yeah so this exercise um, is very simple really and it's it's from stoic philosophy Um, if you study that and it's something that um, you know, I would say even stoicism, if I'm not a religious person, but it is my guiding light as far as spiritual development um, and thought development and personal development. But it's very simple. It's like, okay, you think about that thing that you want to do, right? That risk you want to take, you know, maybe it's starting that company. Um, you know, uh, trying to think of a really, my wife, you know, we keep talking about uh, she wants to start a company of pon- Ponchi is these little Brazilian cheese balls. She makes them. They're delicious. Yeah, I've right? had them and they are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. They're amazing. Everybody would give them to me. They're amazing. I'm like, why don't we, you know, what happens if we start a business on this and, you know, just to use that small example is like, okay, well, let's say we want to start the business and maybe we just do it for two hours on the weekends. We just make a batch every weekend. Then we go to a farmer's market and sell. Right. Most people are like, well, that's so risky. Or, you know, or in their minds, there's this thing, but it's like, okay, and this is one small example. And I'll give a bigger one. Well, what's the worst thing that can happen? Mm. People don't buy them and you end up sitting at the farmer's market with a bunch of delicious food. <laughs> you eat more ponche queso. Yeah. yeah. You eat more cheese balls, right? Yeah. That's it. Is that going to happen? Probably not. People are probably going to buy them because they're delicious. Mm-hmm. Now, that's one small example. Let's talk about the, the bigger one. Let's talk about somebody who's like, has this great business idea. And they know that it's going to take, um, you know, 20, 30 hours of the week to get this thing launched. Right. And they really want to do it. You know, like this gentleman I was talking to from, uh, runs air gym, which is like Airbnb for gyms, right? It's a great idea, but he's, he doesn't know if he wants to cut the cord yet on his corporate gig. Right. That's, I'm guessing where a lot of people are at. It's like, should I cut the cord and go for it? Yeah. Sure. Let's boil it down. What's the worst possible thing that can happen if you did, you know, does that mean you move in with your in-laws? Right. If this thing falls flat. Uh, maybe you don't get the funding you need. Like, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? And for most people, um, if you have a support system, some of, some of it's like it's legitimately really bad. Not gonna lie, right? It's like, well, you know, I have to pull my kids out of school. Um, you know, I have to eat at a soup kitchen, um, and we're homeless. You know, but what are the chances? Really think about it. what are the chances of that actually happening? That has to be a very cascading series of events that are probably outside of your control. So realistically, what's the worst thing that can happen? And if that worst case is way less scary than you thought it would be, then maybe that's a great incentive to go for it. And that's it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I do something very similar. Um, and I'll ask, you know, is that the worst case scenario? And can I live with this? And if the yes. answer is ever yes, then I move forward, right? Is it the worst case scenario? Can I live with it? Um, uh, and then and can I mitigate this? In which ways can I mitigate this risk, if, if at all possible, to go through? Because I think, as you said, a lot of us, and, and I'm no different, right, get caught up in this fear trap of this, like, we focus on that worst case scenario and doomsday. So, you know, if I'm going to, you know, oh, I'm going to make this food and, you know, well, people are going to get sick and all these things. And, and if I'm just focused on that, I lose track of the other option and possibilities of what could go right. Um, so I'll t- then that's when I follow up with the next exercise, which is what's the best case scenario. Yeah. And, you know, going towards that light, you know, c- carrot and stick, right? Which one's yeah. better for you to stick. You get beaten by a carrot tracks you and which one, you know, is really more appealing. If you have both visions 
uh, then you get to make that choice and run through. So you've done so much amazing things. Um, you know, you've shared a little bit with us, but you and your wife kind of, you know, you're in Santa Barbara, California, you have the, the gym, extremely successful. Uh, as everybody knows, I was there too. And so I actually used to work out at your facility, which was an amazing facility. You have a successful exit from that business. And then, then kind of what happens next? Like, do you, you guys, I know the story, so it's kind of hard for me to ask these questions because it's so mm -hmm. inspiring, but I know a lot of people are here going, okay, I'm a business owner. And then if I sell my gym or I sell my, you know, um, whatever it is, my firm, I exit, whatever that, that is, what is, what is the possibility there? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can say that when, cause you were there, you know, when I sold the gym, um, we had a plan, you know, uh, a plan of, of a specific niche that we were going to get. And that didn't go the way we thought it was going to go, you know, and that happens, you know, I think, you know, if there's one thing that truly um, dictates success over time is the ability to deal with failure in your relationship with failure and how you adapt with it. So, you know, there's a couple of things, you know, you and I ducked and dived a couple of times, right? And now we're finally on track for something that's tremendous. And it wasn't, you know, I would say it was a full year of education, right? And uh, disappointment, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at times. And it wasn't always pretty. But enjoying the process, and there's a couple of things that I knew if I continued to invest in would pay off. And number one was, you know, um, building an audience, right? Which you can't. Which Eric, you have an amazing. But so everybody knows you have two amazing podcasts yourself mm -hmm. that uh, anybody interested in fitness or in the industry should be subscribing to. So real quick, I'm going to cut you off. And I'm sorry, because I want to make sure everybody knows about these two resources that you're explaining. So what are your podcasts? Yeah, there's the Future of Fitness podcast, which is a full length um, conversational format with leaders in the fitness industry that are focused on one simple thing is I want to make sure that the people, my audience and the people listening are skating to where the puck is going uh, and not to where it is right now or even where it was two minutes ago. And that's really important because our industry changes so fast, just like everything else in our lives right now with technology and new business practices and all these things that are coming at us, hurling at us a thousand miles per hour um, that I want people to be educated. And that's my sole focus is, is to help the industry and kind of push it forward um, as smoothly as possible. And then the Fitness Blitz, which is um, a really fun uh, podcast for me. It's got a nice following as well, which I just get to interview. And it's industry, very industry focused. I get to interview um, people for 10 to 15 minutes from all walks of life within the fitness industry um, from all over the world. And if anybody's listening, you want to be on the show. I do a lot of times, um, many people on the show, it's their first podcast. And that's my, those are my favorite. It's not that people are super seasoned. It's giving people that first uh, taste of what it's like to expose themselves and, and talk about themselves and, and, be authentic. And, uh, yeah, so those are the two that I work on right now. And it's, it's, it's a ton of fun. And, you know, there's certain things like I Seth go and say, there's certain things you always do for free and certain things you always get paid for. Um, I'll always do the podcast for free, you know, but everything else I'm going to charge money. For. <laughs> <laughs> and as you should, man, you're a wealth of knowledge. Uh, you, you were going over business, but tell people a little bit more about the lifestyle choices that you were able to make after that exit. Cause I think that's really, when I talk to business owners and entrepreneurs, they're not as concerned of what's the next business to get into as much of what is that? Where do I live? How do, what, what happens then? Like, I think your story is so inspiring because where are you right now? Uh, I'm on an Island off the coast of Vancouver, uh, called Pender Island. And it's, uh, P E N D E R if you want to look it up, but it's got a population of about 2,300. Um, and in the winter, I think it's about 600. So, uh, in a very small place, it's beautiful. Um, but I can work, my wife and I can work from anywhere and that's by design, right? We wanted a lifestyle that, um, you know, we could, we could live in multiple places. What I didn't mention in my story is when we decided to sell the gym and move to a quote unquote mountain town, my wife's reply was, well, why don't we go live in a bunch of mountain towns? I was like, whew. I love you. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and that's it. what kind of sparked this, this nomadic lifestyle. It wasn't intention. We just found that it really suits what we desire. Like, and I think it all comes down to Doug and we talk about all the time personally, but maybe people don't talk about enough, um, who are listening is understanding one's values. Mm -hmm. You know, like for me, freedom and my wife too, we share that value in our top three of, of what our values are. Freedom of lifestyle is really, really big. 
and travel and new experiences and things like that. So we were building that lifestyle or that business around that lifestyle. And that's like, man, if you're looking for inspiration, you know, you know tie into your deepest values and tie that into your business. And there won't be a day that goes by that you'll be like, I, I, I like you. Sometimes you drag yourself to do work because you're tired or whatever is going on in your life. But most days you'll find a bottomless, uh, you know, source of, of inspiration in what you do. Well, it's so true. And it's so poignant. And, you know, you guys are living the lifestyle that most people aspire to or dream of, right? Mm -hmm. You read about it and you're like, ah, does that guy really exist? You know, does that yeah. woman really exist? And here you are living, breathing, you know, um, manifestation of living a life on your own story. You guys wrote it and made it true because you're on this amazing island, but two months from now, you'll be someplace completely different, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I, I've done that twice. So the gym was the same thing. I'm like, well, you know, I want to live this life where I'm a gym owner in Santa Barbara, California. I live by the beach. I have this great community of friends and I built it and I did it. Um, and I think, and everyone always says, well, you're living the dream, man. Remember that was told all the time. Right. But the thing is, it wasn't my dream mm -hmm. and, or was it Eric's dream in 2008 or was it Eric's dream in 2017? And I, I, I get all, and people say this all, they're like, dude, you're living the dream. You know, they do, they do that a lot. And, and maybe I, I and I am. Um, but I think that's a trap too, because I think a lot of people are told, Hey, you're living the dream, man. And meanwhile, on their inside internally, they're like, Kevin yeah, doesn't fucking feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it. You're living the dream, but is it your dream? And that's the important yes. question. That's the important thing. Yes. And that's where I think all change should come from um, is don't be afraid, you know, kind of looping back to what I would like to really message to people is don't be afraid to change because external, you know, society or external factors are telling you that you're living the dream. Mm. Say that one more time because be. people really need to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't settle for your current situation because everyone else in society is telling you that you're living the dream. Yeah. You know, you know, there could be, um, you know, on this, by this point in my career, if I had stuck back in corporate, um, I would definitely be at a VP level, you know, probably making a ton more money than I make now. <laughs> and people be like, dude, you're living the dream. Yep. At a happy hour, not happy, but at the hour. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A fat bank account. That means nothing. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is that happens so often and you and I know this cause we coach some of these people, but they have a fat paycheck, not bank account, because they've yeah. spent all their money trying to fill the void that they're feeling, driving a better car because, hey, that'll make me feel better for the first few weeks, getting nice cult yeah. clothes, you know, all those things that we fill ourselves up with in the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, which, absolutely. Which is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, Eric, you know, Obviously, we could talk about this, and I want to have you back on again. I can't believe we took so long to get you on, um, <laughs> which is crazy. But again, it's like you say, you talk to somebody so often, you're like, oh, yeah, like, you know, you need to be sharing this message to everybody. Um, for yeah. people that want to know more about you, the fitness accelerator, the things that you're up to, what are the best ways for them to get a hold of you and learn more? Yeah. Uh, well, the best place in the more light, most likely place is probably Facebook, if you just go to Eric Malzone. Um, I believe there's only two of us in the world and I'm the one not from Brazil. Um, <laughs> there you go. And, uh, you know, uh, you can find me there. Uh, and of course, you know, on fitness professional online, I'm, I'm all over that thing as you are as well. And, uh, you know, the fitness accelerator, if you go to fitness professional online, uh, dot com, you go to forward slash fit accelerator. If you are in the fitness community, if you're a fitness entrepreneur, um, and you are thinking, maybe there's a better way to do business. Maybe it's not all about lead generation. Maybe it's not all about, um, you know, these, these short term tactic tactics that won't develop my business in 10 years. You're probably right. There is a better way. Um, and it's really simple. It's, it's, uh, building relationships with people in the industry and leveraging each other's networks and knowledge bases and no one else is doing it. No one's taken the, um, initiative to, to build a community like this within the fitness profession, but Doug and I are, and it's very powerful. And, uh, it's literally the best investment you'll make, um, possibly ever. 
So, uh, yeah, I, I would go check it out if I was you, if you're in the industry for sure. It's very special. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't even say possibly. I'll say it is an amazing investment. Uh, you know, Eric and I do the, the fitness accelerator really to connect people. Uh, it's not a moneymaker for us in the sense that it's not going to change our lifestyles, but I believe it will change the industry. So uh, for those fit pros, make sure you connect with Eric as soon as possible and get on his podcast. What an amazing opportunity there. Uh, Eric, man, thanks so much for have, being on, dude. We'll definitely have you on again uh, in the near future. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. It's a lot of fun, man. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question for you. What if you could transform your life for the better in just 90 days? Would you do it? Our 90-Day Game is an online program and community created for people like you who are ready to make a shift and take those dreams and goals they've been talking about for years and turn them into a reality within 90 days. Go to authorofyourownstory.com forward slash 90-day-game and turn your goals into reality. And don't forget to be the author of your own story.